Oh. All right. Happy Thursday. I don't have anything to start, so why don't we start a question, Stephanie? Thank you. Uh, so Biden and Netanyahu are due to meet. What's the main message that the U.S. is going to convey in this meeting? And what more does Israel need to do to bring this ceasefire to a reality? So I actually think they're meeting right now, or at least um, we're scheduled to uh, for a meeting that's starting right now. The secretary is there attending that meeting. And uh, I, I would expect that the primary focus of this will be on the ongoing negotiations to reach a ceasefire deal that would bring home the hostages, including the American hostages who remain held inside Gaza, um, that would alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, that we think would set the conditions for lasting peace and lasting regional stability. And so I think the message from the American side in that meeting will be that we need to get this deal over the line, that we have been working on this for some time. Uh, it's been a tough negotiation. We've made progress. We've gotten a framework agreement, and, and we now need to bridge the final def differences and get a deal, and get a deal in place so we can all move forward. And what more do you need to see from Israel, and what more do you need to see from Hamas to get this over the finish line? So I don't want to negotiate in public, um, uh, but we did get a, I think it was a significant breakthrough that we got an agreement on the framework that the president laid out. Um, obviously, there were pieces of that framework that we had been negotiating for months and that we had been pushing for agreement on for months. But there are still some remaining issues. Some of those uh, we haven't ever talked about them publicly, I, I don't believe, but some of those have been reported publicly that have remained sticking points. But we do believe there are practical solutions that we have put on the table, that the other mediators have put on the table, that would bridge the divide between the two parties. And so what we need to see is uh, for an agreement to be reached. And that means um, both sides coming to the table in good faith and being willing to reach an agreement. And we think we can get there, but there's more work to do. And what was your take on Netanyahu's speech to Congress yesterday? Did it leave you with any concerns about his willingness to reach a deal? I don't have any overall take on his speech. Obviously, we'd heard uh, many of the things that uh, he said uh, publicly yesterday. We've heard him say before in press conferences. And having been to the region with the secretary eight times, I have heard many of the things that he said publicly. I've heard him say privately uh, in meetings that, that, uh, that we have held with him. Um, but no, there was nothing in the speech that um, made us any more or less concerned about our chances to reach a, a ceasefire deal. Um, Israel has continued to commit to us that they want to reach a ceasefire, and they have continued to join negotiations with the U.S., with Egypt, with Qatar, to try to reach an agreement. And as always, we're going to judge them by the actions that they take, not necessarily what they say as, uh, in public. Okay, and then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff today said he has still not been able to see much from Israel about its day after planning once the war with Hamas ends, saying there's not a lot of detail he's been able to see from a plan from them. What's the latest on this, and are you satisfied with the pace at which the is Israelis are putting this plan together? So that's accurate. They have not put forward uh, a great deal of detail about plans for the day after, but we have been having conversations with them about this, and they are in a different place than they were several months ago when they hadn't really thought about a day after at all. And you heard the secretary talk about the dangers of Israel not planning for a day after and what it would mean uh, for the future of Gaza and, and what a security threat it would pose to the state of Israel and the people of Israel. Since then, we have been engaged in conversations with them as well as with our Arab partners. There are ideas that we have put forward. There are ideas that uh, our Arab partners have put forward. And there have been some ideas that Israel has put forward, not fully developed yet, not fully to the, the place where I think you could call them a proposal. but. We are at the point where we're talking with them and they're putting forward some ideas. Uh, and it is important that they take the matter seriously, uh, just as it's important everyone take the matter uh, seriously. Because as you have heard the secretary say, in the absence of realistic plans for the day after the conflict, you will either have uh, Israel occupying Gaza, which we reject. They have said they don't want to do. You will have Hamas in charge, which obviously is not in the interest of Israel and clearly is also not in the interest of the region. Or you'll have chaos and anarchy, um, which is a, a breeding ground for terrorism, uh, will, will uh, hurt the interests of the Palestinian people in Gaza, make it harder for them to get food and water and civilian assistance. It really not, is not in anyone's interest. So we're going to continue to push them to engage seriously on these plans because they're critical, not just to the future of the Palestinian people, but to the future of Israel as well. Okay, and last one, uh, sorry, what should we expect in terms of meetings over the next week to try and reach the ceasefire deal? So I don't want to preview any uh, specific meetings. Obviously the one happening today is important. It's important that 
the leaders of our two countries engage on this. It's always important when negotiators get in a room too, um, but it takes political consensus as well. And so um, oftentimes when you see the secretary in the region um, pushing for a ceasefire deal, there's work that's going on at a working level to try and hammer out through the details. But the secretary is there pushing for political will and political agreement and um, political courage to move forward um, by parties to a deal. And I think that's the same thing you will see um, uh, the president doing in the meeting today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, just to understand a little bit more in terms of this meeting today, this is, is the, this is not an opportunity for the Israeli prime minister to push any new demands. Is that correct? Oh, so I'm not going to speak for the prime minister. Obviously, I've made clear what we think will be the primary uh, subject of the meeting, won't be the only subject. Obviously, I'm sure that they will cover humanitarian assistance. They will cover the threat from Iran. They will cover uh, uh, stability in the region. There are any number of things that they, they will discuss. But that's the primary objective from our standpoint. But you know, both sides but, get to talk in a meeting, so I'm sure that the well, just, the prime minister will have his own uh, points of view to make clear as well. Okay, we're just asking that in the context of these Israeli negotiators pushing back their trip um, to do in-person talks, and whether that was related to the timing of Netanyahu's meeting with Biden. Um, but on the just pivoting to his address to Congress, I mean, you mentioned that he didn't say anything that would affect. Um, uh, hostage ceasefire talks, but he did say some pretty derogatory things about U.S. protesters, um, having mentioned that this is a citadel of democracy, the United States, and then to call American protesters uh, Tehran's useful idiots, um, and also uh, to <clears throat> cite U.S. intelligence saying that Iran had uh, financed protesters. That is something that has been said, but we don't know the full extent of that. Do you have anything to say uh, in response to the Israeli Prime Minister uh, labeling American protesters in that way, given that this is a substantial part of the voting population in this country? Yeah, let me just speak about um, protests in general, and including the protests that we saw in Washington yesterday, including the statement that the Director of National Intelligence uh, released, I think it was two weeks ago now. So first of all, with respect to her statement, she made very clear in releasing it that the United States, this administration, strongly support the right to protest uh, the actions that our government takes, and that we have seen Iranian support for protests, but that we understand that the vast majority of protesters in America are not taking their orders from Iran, and that most of the uh, people who might have received support from Iran wouldn't even know that that's where it was coming from. So I think we ought to just be very clear about the facts that the Director of National Intelligence made public in that statement she released. On the overall issue of protests, so look, as I said, this administration, the United States and this administration in particular strongly supports the right of any American to protest. Um, people questioning our government, speaking up, speaking out about the policy choices that we have made. It's part of the healthy democratic process. It, um, it actually strengthens the fabric of this nation. But at the same time, something is seriously wrong when you see people marching through the streets of Washington carrying Hamas banners, literal, literal Hamas banners, carrying the Hamas flag down the streets of Washington, DC. When you see people spray painting on fountains in Washington that Hamas is coming, when you see them displaying signs calling for the death of Jews, when you see them burning American flags, it's despicable. It's hateful. It runs contrary to the values of this country. I think especially when you consider what that flag that we saw being burned yesterday stands for, and one of the things it stands for is the right to protest, the right to make your views known, make them known peacefully. It's one of the things that makes this country what it is and what it has been for almost 250 years. So anyone, I would say to anyone that is burning an American flag while spray painting pro-Hamas graffiti uh, in Washington to stop and think for a moment about what would happen if they were protesting Hamas's rule in Gaza. And it's not a question that you have to look very hard for an answer because we know, because we've seen in the past, when people have protested in Hamas's rule in Gaza, we've seen how Hamas has responded. They responded with brutal crackdowns, with arrests, with violent repression. 
Fortunately, that is not who we are in this country. That is not who we are going to be in this country. We stand by, as I said, the right to protest, the right to, to dissent. And I know that the vast majority of people who were on the streets of Washington yesterday were patriotic Americans who were making their views known, even if they disagree with the choices that their elected officials make and the choices that we make, and we support their right to do so. But for those who were out yesterday showing support for Hamas, I would ask them to just think very hard about the choices they're making and who they are really supporting, um, because it is not peace, it's not democracy, and it is certainly not the values that we share as Americans. Okay, and just one more, yeah, sorry, can it just, on, on his address as well, he had mentioned that Israel has gone to extraordinary efforts to send, to drop leaflets, to make phone calls in Gaza, and also he cited a West Point expert saying that this is, you know, who's a, he said in the entire history of wars that Israel has, you know, done more to, you know, make sure that they don't hurt civilians. And um, do you have any comment on some of the things that he said when you look at the conclusions of the NSM report, which did question whether, you know, Israel is, has been able to, to be compliant with international law, that there, there is still mm -hmm. concern that it hasn't, and that when it comes to things like leafleting, that perhaps more could have been done. Yeah. Um, I mean, you stand by the conclusions of that. US we do. So look, response to his yeah. Response. So we do stand by the conclusions of that report. It, it is certainly accurate that Israel has taken steps to minimize minimize civilian harm. This, the prime minister went through the, them yesterday. Um, there have been others that he didn't detail, but that we've heard them speak to in the past, and that they briefed us on the, in the past. But it is also true that thousands upon thousands of innocent civilians have died as a result of this military campaign. Obviously, we all recognize, we've talked about it in this briefing room a number of times about the really difficult task that Israel faces when you have Hamas hiding behind uh, civilians, making them human shields. But at the same time, uh, we still believe that Israel needs to do more to minimize civilian casualties. That includes in Rafah. That includes in the campaigns that they are conducting now in Khan Yunus. Uh, there are uh, innocent civilians who are in harm's way, who um, had nothing to do with the decision by Hamas to start this war and probably want to see it end immediately. And Israel needs to take great care to minimize harm to those innocent civilians because they are in a conflict that, that, uh, that they did not start, they did not make, and, and I suspect in many cases want to end. Hey, after. Go Thank ahead. You, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, just taking you know, your response to Camilla on the protest and so on. I mean, as despicable as the burning of the flag, the American flag is, and it is a despicable act. Um, but you know, it has it was it was done during the anti-war movement against Vietnam. It was done, you know, to protest the the war on Iraq and so on, and and many other times. But it's what you said, you said this, they have they have the right to do that. You know? Correct. And that's really what makes this country different than any other place. Correct. So, and you talked about the patriotism of those people are protesting. And here's my question: Is it appropriate for a foreign leader to come? and speak from the Congress, you know, to the raucous applause uh, of, of those present uh, about calling those Americans, you know, useful idiots of an animus foreign uh, power and basically questioning their patriotism and so on. Is it appropriate of him to do that? So I am not going to make assessments mm -hmm. about what the prime minister said or what he believes. I will speak on behalf of the United States, and I just right. gave you our views about protests and how we see the connection between protests and the attempts by the Iranian government to influence those protests. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'll let the prime minister speak for himself. Well, you know, uh, do we have any information that Iran has actually financed these protests? We do. In any way? We do. We made, that, we made that um, uh, public in the statement that they uh, had supported. Now, again, when I say these protests, I'm not speaking to any one specific protest, and as the Director of National Intelligence made clear, the vast majority of protesters have nothing, nothing to do with Iranian influence. Uh, that is an important factual thing. But yes, we do have evidence that Iran is supporting evidence that they actually protests. finance some of these protests? Correct. Correct. Okay. All right, let me just move on then. I have a couple of other things uh, to, to ask about. Uh, now, I know you mentioned the, the, about the loss of life in, in Gaza and so on. But the new report, it's really, it's just staggering by air wars. And it talks about, you know, how accurate the figures that are being, you know, announced by the, the Ministry of Health in Gaza. And these are horrific figures. I mean, you know, everybody talks about the day after, 
But really the day now, I mean the present day, is a horrific day. I mean we're talking about a, a place that is being subjected to war where 80% of that space has been destroyed, where you know a huge number of people have been killed and so on. When you look at it in those kind of uh, percentages and so on, it really is staggering. And I, you know, I mean, how, how can we go forward uh, looking at this carnage and this, you know, going day in and day out without feeling the, a sense of urgency to basically say, this is the time to end it? So a few things. One, with respect to the numbers themselves, you heard us speak to these before, that uh, I think I, the term I use, I think they're probably directionally accurate, which is not to say they're accurate down to the precise number um, uh, or what percentage they're off by. And, and that is due to a number of things. Number one, the way in which the numbers are being assessed has changed over time, where they're no longer releasing the, the, the names, which they were, I think, in the first month or two or three of those who were killed. Um, second thing is that some percentage of that number, and I think that's unknowable, some percentage of the number that's released are not civilians, are militants, right? And, oh, really? and, and we don't know the exact yeah. number. But then it's also true that there are probably, uh, almost certainly, a number of innocent civilians who are buried under the rubble, who remain accounted for, who aren't included in that number. So what the actual number is, I think we don't know, but it is um, far, far too high. Um, so when you ask the, the, there's something you said in the, the lead up to the question is how do we, um, where do we go from here? And I think the, the what we would say, um, one of the, the, the difficult things that this region has faced for so long is there has been such tremendous loss on both sides of this conflict. Obviously thousands of Palestinians killed in the war in Gaza. 1,200 Israelis who were killed on October 7th. And I would say the question that we would put to both uh, the state of Israel and to leaders in the Palestinian community is where we go from here ought to be something different and how do we get there? And the way to get there is to stop the dehumanization on both sides of people who don't look like them, don't believe the same thing as them, don't have the same views, and try to see each other as humans, and try to reach political solutions that will break this conflict of violence. And so what we're trying to do is an immediate step to get to do that, and when I say try to do it, I mean literally right now in a meeting between the President and the Prime Minister is to get a ceasefire agreement that would start to build a foundation to get us out of this mess. Now, my last question regarding the uh a uh, number of uh, UN workers that have been killed, about 366. And my question pertains to the, you know, to the day after in terms of aid and so on, and aid workers and organizations and so on. Would, would you, do you think this is discouraging for organizations to go in in Gaza and, and do their work? In yeah, the it's, it, uh, of course it is. Of course, every um, person who's thinking about um, signing up to be an aid worker, signing up to deliver humanitarian assistance, signing up to, uh, if you're a doctor or a nurse, to provide medical and assist assistance uh, inside Gaza. Of course, they can't help, I'm sure, but think about the personal risk that they put themselves under. Uh, it's why it's so remarkable that so many people, despite those risks, continue to go do it every day. Uh, and it speaks to the enormous courage that they show in uh, putting their lives potentially on the line to help other people. Um, you've heard the secretary say that the, the remarkable thing about humanitarian workers is that not just in this conflict, but all around the world, they run to the conflict. Uh, when times when other people are, for very good reason, running away, they run to it and they, they um, uh, try to help other people. And it just highlights the need to, while the conflict's ongoing, do everything we can to protect humanitarian workers, and we do um, uh, we work on that every day, but then ultimately, as I've said, to get a ceasefire. Yeah, yeah. Go, yeah go ahead. Yeah, um, so um, on Tuesday, you were asked about the Beijing Declaration. Has the U.S. get a chance to review the text, and has the United States spoken to Abbas directly regarding the declaration? And uh, the declaration mentioned unity under the framework of PLO. What is the U.S. perspective to bring Hamas under the umbrella of PLO? Thank so, you. So a few things. We have, of course, seen the declaration now, which we hadn't um, when, I, when I spoke to this uh, Monday or Tuesday, whenever it was. Um, I, I would say that a, a few things about it. Just in terms of the context, it's important to remember that 
Fatah and Hamas have signed a number of previous declarations similar to this that ultimately have gone nowhere. So we'll wait to see what this ultimately means. But I think that's important context for, for everyone to remember. But when it comes to the, the question about um, uh, the PLO, I think the important thing is that nowhere in this declaration did Hamas agree to the principles of the PLO. Nowhere either in this declaration or anywhere else have they renounced violence, have they re <coughs> renounced the destruction of the state of Israel, have they renounced terrorism, and have they committed to nonviolent political means to try to achieve the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people. So I think that tells you a lot about their intent, their continued motives, um, as does the fact that they continue to launch terrorist attacks against the state of Israel as recently as the last few weeks, launching rockets, um, tells you about their, their true political motives. Is this agreement reached in, Bay, in China uh, similar to any similarity to the 2022 Algeria broker deal? So I'm not going to look at the, I, I, I can't tell you the exact text is the same uh, as the exact te text of the uh, that agreement, but there have been a number of agreements signed, not just that one, but going back all the way to 2010, 2011, where you've seen Hamas and Fatah sign similar so-called reconciliation agreements that ultimately have proven not to be worth the paper that they're written on. My paper on which they're written. I hate when people finish a sentence in a preposition. I just did it. Go ahead, Gita. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> um, the Islamic Republic of Iran has gone on another execution spree and in the past month has executed a number of people. Um, isn't the State Department in default of the Mahsa Act, based on which you were supposed to designate some senior leadership of the Islamic Republic for violation of human rights? Um, so we are actively implementing the law as passed by Congress uh, and signed by the president. Um, we do continue to enforce all of our sanctions on Israel, or, I'm sorry, on uh, uh, Iran, a number which we have imposed for violations of, of human rights. Um, and in terms of that specific law and the report that it calls for, we are actively working on the report and we'll submit it to Congress as soon as it's done. I would just note kind of as a side note that Congress does mandate a lot of reports for us to prepare and never when they mandate those reports do they provide us additional appropriations to fund the writing of said reports. But we are working on it and we will have it up to them as soon as we have well, it. Well, for this purpose, you don't have to look very far. The individuals are out there. You don't have to dig too deep. Um, so uh, all I will say is that we continue to work on implementing the law um, uh, and providing that report. And another one also relating to sanctions, since uh, you also mentioned it. Um, according to the head of Iran's Atomic Energy Agency, um, they have been exporting or selling heavy water and radio pharmaceuticals on the global market for a while now nuclear services and goods. Uh, isn't that in violation of uh, sanctions? Uh, so um, I will have to take that back. I just don't want to I don't want to make a legal uh, sanctions violation judgment from here uh, about what does and doesn't violate the sanctions. Obviously, um, you've heard us say before, we've imposed over 600 sanctions and export controls. But with respect to any specific violation, let me take that back and look at it and get you an answer. OK, thank you. Yeah, Shannon. Thank you. Can I ask about the Russian and Chinese warplanes that were intercepted on the coast of Alaska? Uh, from your perspective, uh, the diplomatic perspective, is it concerning to see this kind of cooperation? And has there been any kind of communication with your Russian or Chinese counterparts? So uh, a few things about that. Number one, with respect to uh, military cooperation between China and Russia, we have said for, for some time um, that we're concerned about the relationship between the two countries. We're concerned about the way that China continues to fuel um, Russia's war against Ukraine by Chinese companies taking steps to rebuild their defense industrial base. Um, when it comes to this specific action, um, uh, I believe off the coast of Alaska, I will defer to the, the Pentagon to comment on this, the, the details of it, but we do not assess that in any way it's a threat to the security of the United States. And I know you can't preview any actions, but especially with China supporting Russia's war in Ukraine. I, the Secretary of Defense said or implied that they're just going to watch and see what happens between those two countries. But is there any kind of uh, consideration of the State Department for further actions? There are a number of things um, that are under consideration. Um, I will note that we have already imposed over 300 sanctions and export controls on Chinese entities for their support the port, uh, to Russia for the war against Ukraine. We will not hesitate to impose additional measures as necessary. And it's important to remember that 
this is not just an issue that concerns the United States, and it's certainly not an issue that just impacts the United States. It's a threat to European security. And so we have also been uh, in, co in conversations with our European partners about what actions they might take, and of course they can speak to those. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Back to Netanyahu's speech yesterday, following up on uh, Said's question on, you know, uh, foreign leader of a country uh, who was speaking in front of Congre American Congress, criticizing American protesters who are mostly, you know, using their freedom uh, of assembly. Do you consider this as an, uh, you know, uh, interference in U.S. domestic affairs? Uh, no, it's not an interf uh, It's certainly not. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it interference in domestic affairs. The prime minister has the uh, look. He was invited by Congress. He has the right to come and and speak his mind, um, say what he thinks. But by the same token, we have the right to speak ours, and we'll we'll do that. But what was your reaction when you heard when he said this? At the American Congress. So I am gonna. As I've always kind of made a rule not to just. Uh, reply to specific things that the prime minister says. Ultimately, when we have concerns with him, we often take it up with him privately. Uh, but as I said, he is free to, to say what he wants about protests, and we will say what we believe. And I made clear what the United States believes about protests, which is that every American has the right to peacefully um, exercise their First Amendment rights. We think it makes our country stronger. Um, at the same time, we do, commit, we do condemn acts of hatred, acts of anti-Semitism, uh, some of which we saw yesterday. Just uh, a quick one more on that. Um, you know, on the international side of things, uh, many people around the world were outraged by what we have seen yesterday. You know, Netanyahu, who is accused of war crimes and genocide by international courts, uh, spoke before, uh, before the U.S. Congress and received, you know, more than 70 applause from U.S. Congress members. Are you aware of this and have any countries uh, expressed concern about this? So I would say that um, most, if not all, of the countries that we deal with are quite familiar with the separation of powers in the United States, understand that Congress is an independent branch and that this invitation was issued by Congress, not by the president or the executive branch. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. Two questions. First, uh, personally, Thanks. do you expect a ceasefire uh, agreement soon? Uh, I don't want to put any kind of tame t timetable on it, as I've been reluctant to do really since the outset of these discussions. Uh, second, the UAE is more open now uh, on discussing sending troops to Gaza. Do you have an, uh, an agreement with the uh, with uh, them and other Arab states to uh, send troops? Um, so the question of how we ensure security in Gaza at the end of a conflict is something that we have been actively discussing with our Arab partners. The Secretary has made this clear uh, during his travels in the region. It has been one of the leading topics of discussion when we've traveled around, and it's been um, one of the leading topics of discussion, especially with this core Quint group that the Secretary assembled, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and, and Qatar. Um, we don't have any specific agreements uh, yet on how uh, security would be established, but we have been pr putting proposals forward. Uh, our Arab partners have been putting proposals forward. We've been talking through what various countries might or might not be willing to do, what they would need um, from other parties to, um, to secure their agreement. Um, to participate, and that those are ongoing conversations. And who are the other countries who are ready to send troops other than... So I didn't stipulate that any one country was ready to send troops. That was a, that was the stipulation of your question, not something I said from here. I'm certainly not going to speak for any country at all in the region. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, thank you. Going back to Netanyahu's speech to Congress, actually. Uh, so Prime Minister said specifically with regards to Rafah, and I quote, practically no civilians killed in Rafah, and it got actually standing ovation from U.S. Congress, and you hear, I know it's different branches, State Department and Congress, and you hear acknowledging thousands of civilians, innocent civilians were killed by this mil as a result of this military campaign. So I'm wondering, do you think your statements here and that Congress's reaction to Netanyahu's remarks, and it was a false claim verifiable by various respectable news organizations, including uh, ones in the United States, uh, sending maybe conflicting messages to the rest of the world with regards to what U.S. really wants uh, and so, how it approaches to this conflict? So again, 
we don't speak for Congress, yeah. and Congress doesn't speak for us. Mm -hmm. And I hope most people around the world would understand that um, and understand that we are a big democracy with people with a host of different views from all sides of the political spectrum. There are people inside the Congress, including people who are at the speech today, who strenuously support everything that Israel has done. And there are other members of Congress, including some who are making their views known in the chamber, who strenuously oppose things that Israel does. That's, what part, of, that's, that's part of what being in a democracy does. I speak on behalf of the executive branch, and I'll continue to make our views known on policy matters. I'll continue to make um, uh, our views known about the facts of what has happened uh, in Gaza and where we ought to, uh, ought to go from here. When it comes to civilian casualties in Rafah, of course there have been civilian casualties in Rafah. Um, we have all seen uh, verified reports of civilian casualties during the conflict there. Now, one thing that is true the number of civilian casualties in the Rafa campaign is significantly lower than the number of ca human casualties in the campaign in Gaza City and in the campaign in Khan Yunus. We think that's for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, a number of people in Rafa evacuated sooner uh, uh, or, or early in the campaign, before the campaign really began in earnest. Another of the, the, the reasons we think is that um, we were pushing Israel to execute a more limited campaign than what they did in Gaza City and what they did in Khan Yunus, and they ultimately did that. But of course, there were still civilians that died in Rafah, and every civilian death is a tragedy. And I understand you're speaking on behalf of the United States. So should I, I when you are saying we are a big democracy, different branches, so Congress's reaction to Netanyahu's speech, doesn't that represent what the United States want with regards to what Israel So. Once there are in that 535 members of Congress. They don't all have the same view. And each one of them has a vo vote and has a voice in what Congress does. And um, some of them share the views of the administration. Some of them don't, to put matters lightly. Um, and they, come from, they uh, have all sorts of, of different views. So people, I think, when making assessments about what the United States believes, they've got to look at you know, when you make uh, you want to make an assessment about what the executive branch believes, you can look at what the president says, the secretary says, and what I say. When you want to uh, uh, look to what Congress believes, you have to look at what they say, but ultimately how they vote. Yeah, thank you. Because yeah. I wanted to ask, because Turkish foreign minister just harshly criticized the U.S. Congress's reaction to Netanyahu. I wonder, since the ceasefire talks are ongoing, I wonder whether do you find those maybe false claims made by Netanyahu towards Congress somehow troubling? With regards I to ceasefire talks. I don't, I don't uh, assess that anything the Prime Minister said yesterday is going to have an impact on the ceasefire talks one way or the other. Thank you. Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Uh, several, several topics, but before that, let me follow up on the Masa Act, which just said, um, which is about you know, sanctioning Iranian leadership for gross human rights violations. The other day, in response to Michelle's question, in fact, um, on a different occasion, you said that you believe Iranian Supreme Leader is in charge of decision-making process. Do you have any doubt in your mind that Iranian leaders are not are responsible for uh, the king of Masa and, and others. Uh, so th uh, obviously the government of Iran is responsible for all the actions that the regime takes. Then why is the U.S. government is so reluctant to uh, you know, impose human rights sanctions on Iranian civilians? leader? <laughs> Alex, I love the, the we have often you and I have often tangled over this question when uh, uh, we've, we've talked about it in the context of Russia, um, where you will often seize on one particular action that you wish that the United States would take and ignore the vast sea of other actions that we have taken. When it comes to Iran, we have imposed over 600 sanctions and export controls for Iran's behavior across a wide range uh, of areas, including their support for terrorism, including uh, their hostile actions to their neighbors, and of course, including for their brutal crackdown on human rights at home. Uh, and I think you can expect to see us continue to take the, those actions. But as you've also heard me say before, I'm never going to engage with you on one specific proposed sanction because we don't preview those in advance for, I think, very good reasons. I mean, so it's not me. It's the law of the land. You know, the U.S. Congress is asking the U.S. government to take this action. Moving to uh, Russia uh, and uh, Ukraine. So Romania has confirmed uh, that um, more Russian drones uh, you know, uh, it showed up in its uh, airspace. Uh, three Shahids only from last night. Does this require a decisive action or response from NATO? So I'm not going to speak to uh, that matter only because there is still an ongoing investigation um, uh, into what exactly happened and how it might happen, uh, how, how it might have happened. And I think it's not appropriate for me to comment 
uh, on it um, uh, in advance, but obviously we fully support uh, all of our NATO allies. The President has made that clear uh, from the outset of this conflict and from the outset of the administration. Is there any discussion going behind us in between the allies? And I'm never going to talk about uh, pri private so, uh, one, one, Alex, uh, I'm going to move on only because I got to leave in well, nine. Well, I, I, I have to leave in nine minutes. I see a number of people with their hands up. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, on student visas and Iranian um, schools are opening very soon, and there are so many Iranian students still waiting for their visas and clearances. Yeah. Um, do you have any plans, any initiatives to expedite the process for these students? So let me just say that every year um, we welcome thousands of <laughs> Iranian students to college campuses and universities. Um, we have very strong disagreements with the uh, leadership. Uh, in, in Tehran, but we have no quarrel with the Iranian people who are uh, the victims of repression and victims of the brutal tactics by uh, the Iranian regime. Um, let me just say, there were, just as a, a factual matter, there were 10,000 Iranian students who studied in the United States during the, the last academic year, up 16% from, from the year before, all of whom we granted visas to, to come and study in the United States. Um, we do expect those numbers to increase over time, but as I've said before when I've asked about, sim uh, asked about uh, similar matters, I think from, from Gita actually, I can't speak to the specifics of any one visa case or really any category of visa cases, other than to say that, you know, every visa decision we make is a national security decision. Um, Every prospective traveler has to go through uh, extent. It wasn't it wasn't studied this time. Somebody's some, somebody's displaying their Google directions to get, to get the hell out of here. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know who that is. Um, every every visa applicant has to undergo extensive security screening. We take that incredibly seriously. Um, we go through a thorough process before granting visas to individual. But we think it's important um, to grant those visas as expeditiously as possible. And I think that's pr been shown by the fact that we have granted so many visas to Iranian students a number that has increased, as I said, from the, the uh, uh, two years ago to the previous year, and we expect to continue to increase. So but the State Department is precisely in charge of this. You don't have any plans specifically for Iranian students so that they won't miss the deadlines. Uh, so as I just said, we have already seen um, uh, the, let me, let's say it a different way. The proof ultimately, I, I know you all, we always get, um, anecdotal cases that are put forward to us as often in this briefing room. But the proof ultimately of how we're doing when it comes to looking at any matter can be in the data. And when you look at the data here, it shows that the number of students who have received visas from Iran has increased. And we expect it to continue to increase. Now, of course, that um, doesn't mean that every visa gets approved. And it certainly doesn't mean that every visa gets approved uh, quickly, because sometimes they're just harder questions that we have to answer in doing our screening. Um, but we do try to go through it as quickly as possible so we can get those visas approved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, separate topic on journalist, Asu Kamashev. Um, has her conviction, conviction brought the, the State Department closer to designating her as wrongfully detained? And do you think that designation would have made her conviction less likely? Um, so first of all, uh, it just has not been our experience in watching what Russia does that a wrongful determination, or, I'm sorry, a wrongful detention determination has any impact on the decisions that they make to charge and ultimately convict people. That's to a answer the, the second part of the question. Um, with respect to the determination itself, uh, all I can say is that's a decision that remain, or it's a determination that remains ongoing inside the State Department. Um, but that this is a, a case that we take incredibly seriously. The secretary himself uh, uh, is engaged uh, on this case, and it takes it incredibly seriously. And we want to see her released. And this second question, quickly, um, with President Biden uh, saying that he's not seeking re-election, and with the two campaigns to replace him that seems to have different world views. How much should the United States be worried that its international adversaries are taking advantage of the perceived weakness between now and January? So I would certainly, um, just as a message to any of those adversaries, that if they at all are trying to, thinking of taking advantage of the upcoming political transition in the United States, which is still six months away, 
um, they should think again, and they should think they should be disabused of the notion that we are anything but focused on the national security challenges that the country faces, and that included responding to our adversaries when appropriate. The, the president has made incredibly clear to the secretary and the rest of the national security team that he expects them to be focused for this next six months, um, that he expects them to advance the foreign policy objectives that he laid out from the outset of the administration and that we have put into place over the course of the last three and a half years. Uh, he wants them to continue to try to advance those objectives over the next six months uh, and that he doesn't want anyone to take their eye off the ball uh, at all. And I can guarantee you that we will not. Yeah. Uh, on Sudan, the RSF has said it will participate in the talks in Switzerland in August. Have you gotten any response from the uh, I do not have any update. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we have not yet gotten a response from the SA SAF. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you very much. One on Ukraine and one on Russia. The Ukrainian parliament is preparing to consider a bill prohibiting the, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in August. Are you aware of the bill and do you have any comments? Uh, uh, I don't have any comment on the bill, no. And my second question is, is about the Arctic, the new Arctic strategy unveiled on Monday by the Pentagon. The Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks said that Russia asserts excessive claims in the Arctic. Do you agree with this assessment and can you explain maybe why is, are they excessive? So um, I would, when it comes to an assessment made by the Pentagon for any kind of detailed questions about that assessment, I would defer you to the Pentagon, who also holds a, a daily press briefing or, or press briefing several times a week um, to question in detail. Uh, but of course, we agree with the assessment made by the Pentagon. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap for questions because I do have a plan to catch. But before I go, I just wanted to note that next week is the last week of our director of press operations, Jennifer Williams. Um, I'm not going to be here next week to note it because I'm going to be traveling with the secretary, but I know all of you uh, in the room have gotten to know her and um, seen what a great service she provides to the department and to her country. <laughs> Agreed. Um, uh, truly one of the best public servants I have worked with in my time in government. Uh, a real credit to uh, her profession and a real credit to the department. And I'm going to miss working with you very much, but I certainly wish you well in your next assignment. I know you will continue to make us all proud. So thank you. With that, thanks everyone.